Our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you guys. I know we've got a lot of people gone up to camp this week, and so uh, be praying for them on the way back. This is, a, I guess, the beginning. I know May usually starts. We're still in the last day of April, but uh, uh, I'm going to be in California all week going to a lectureship at conference at Pepperdine, and uh, so the elders are going to be doing the service next week. I think Chuck is going to be preaching. I'll, I'll be back by then, but... Uh, they're going to be doing the service next week. I think after that is the LTC awards and presentation. So next week, plan on sticking around a little bit so that they can show you all the things that they have learned and all the stuff that they have done. Uh, classes are changing. There's a lot of things happening around here. Classes are changing. Uh, this Wednesday, there's going to be some different classes. Um, we're going to be looking at Hezekiah for the next few weeks. And so I know Libby's going to be doing the uh, ladies class, and I'll be back to do one after this. Uh, Ashby's got mine this time, and there will be some different ones next week as well. So there's lots of stuff going on. Keep posted. Look in your bulletin. We'll get through all of this. Um, we've been talking about the cross for quite a while now, and just... For the last month. So we've talked about the word of the cross, the relationship of the cross, and last week about the empty cross and the empty tomb, that, you know, all of us will have a death, we'll go to a cross, and then we go to a tomb, and a lot of people, that's the end, that the end, they're staying there. That's as far as they've thought. But that's what we wanted to talk about last week, is we want to have an empty cross and an empty tomb so that we are in a different place with God, and we've been able to go there because of Jesus and his cross. And so today we want to talk about how Jesus gives us peace by his cross. This seems very, very different from what we would usually hear, because how do you usually get peace? You have a war, right? And so if you can be the strongest one in the war, you can get peace peace because you will get your way. How do you get peace in an argument? You yell louder than the other guy, right? And that brings peace because he can't yell as loud as you, and so therefore he doesn't win the argument. It usually does not matter who's the most logical. It's usually who's the loudest and makes the most noise about it, and they're usually declared the winner. I'm not sure those are good ways to get peace. They don't seem to be making a better world for us. They don't seem to be making a new way for us. Peace is best done by everybody do what I like, right? So if you guys would just do what I like, the world would be a better place. Of course, you're going to do what you like, and that's going to mess it all up. So, yeah, that's the way we all are, isn't it? Let me suggest to you, it's not about any of us doing what we like. It's about doing what Jesus likes. And I think that's the main thing that we're able to see and understand because Jesus does not come to win the war, although he could. 
Jesus does not come to win the argument by shouting the loudest, although he could. Jesus comes and he wins by a cross. Usually it's violence we would do to somebody else. Jesus comes and says, the violence is going to be done to me. Why would we believe violence brings peace anyway? And yet that's what we always do over and over again. And so he took the violence to himself and said, let's try this. Because it's not about beating somebody else. It's not about threatening somebody else or getting them to comply or getting them to do everything that you said. Because usually by the time we have done all of that, there's not much worth anything left. Because we've destroyed them. And Jesus has made a way where you do not destroy the other person. Where you don't beat them down, you bring them up. You lift them up. It is such a different way of being able to do it and a different way to win. And so in Ephesians 2, the passage that we've been Hearing this morning, he talks about how terrible and awful we were, how we had no relationship, we had no place with God, we were not there with God, we had no connection with God, we had no hope with God. The Jews did. Now, the Jews were close. The Jews had been given a law. The Jews had been given a covenant. The Jews had, but we're not Jewish. At least I'm not. Maybe you are. But if we were not Jewish, then we were just kind of on our own. And the Jews were told, do this, do that, and you'll be right. We were told, be good. What does that mean? As if we could do that. And so we didn't seem to know how to do that or how to understand that. And so as Ephesians starts, he says, you were far off. You were alien to everything of God, but you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Why would he do that? Because he wants to make peace. And he makes us both into one new man. He has broken down the dividing wall. And I think this is incredible the way he's been able to do this. He says, I've broken down the dividing wall, the thing that stood between you all. Because the Jews got all these commandments. They got all this covenant. And we didn't get anything. We were just left to, well, kind of, do on your own, and nobody knew what to do. And so we all did it wrong. The only consolation is the fact that the Jews had the covenant, they had the law, and they did it wrong. And so he says, I'm going to bring everybody together by breaking down that thing that divided us, by breaking down the the thing that said, yes, there are special people in the world, and there were. And he says, I'm going to declare that That's not so anymore. And so he broke down that barrier of one person telling another person that you're lost and you can't be saved because you're not of my tribe. And now, he says, you can tell people how to be saved in Jesus. It's not a matter of telling them how lost they are. It's a matter of telling them how they can be saved. And what an incredible thing that is. He broke down religious superiority. He breaks down pride. He breaks down arrogance. He breaks down any reason why we would think we're better than anyone else. He breaks down rules and, and he makes obedience because of tradition not the standard anymore. It used to be the standard. It used to be if you just do the thing that he said. And that's one of the things that that just does not work anymore. He said, it doesn't matter who your father is. It doesn't matter what has happened before. And that used to be a huge thing. If Abraham is our father, then we have covenant with God. If Abraham is not our father, as in me, at least, maybe the rest of you, that we don't have any covenant with God. And he's broken all of that down. I do need to correct one thing. A couple of weeks ago, I said something about Cain's sons, and I was trying to illustrate how bad the world is and, and things like that. And I've had a couple of people ask me about this. I did not mean by that that we are all descendants of Cain, okay? At one point in the world, we were all going to be descendants of Cain because he was the only one. There was nobody else. 
he had kids, there's not another kid. But then Seth is born, and certainly he had children, and there are other people who are born, and they had children. I was trying to illustrate how the violence of the world is. And Seth's kids are Jewish. He's the Jewish line. Cain's kids are the Gentile line. Here we are again. Same problem. So it's not that everybody in the world came from Cain, but it, it seems as if when you take the violence of that guy and you look at the rest of the world, it does seem like, boy, we've got a mess. Well, it's not just him. There's more people than that. Because when you bring it down to children of Abraham, Isaac is the son of Abraham, right? Child of promise. Everything's good. But Ishmael's also in there. What about Ishmael's kids? Are you one of Ishmael's kids? Or one of Isaac's kids? See, it gets stickier, doesn't it? And then you've got Jacob and Esau. Are you one of Jacob's kids or one of Esau's kids? And there it's getting pretty specific. If you're not Jewish, you're, you've gone to the other side somewhere along that line. And the wars are still going on. And what we need is someone to come and make peace. And that's what Jesus came to do. Between all of us, it does not matter about the ancestry. It does not matter where you came from. He came to be able to make peace, to create one new man making peace, reconciling us to God through a cross, killing the hostility, taking away the law. He changes the argument. Because the argument is no longer about ancestry or about failure or about behavior. It's about grace. That doesn't make a better thing. So he changes the standard of acceptance. Jesus is the last sacrifice of the Old Testament. He is the last Passover lamb. He is also the sacrifice of the New Testament. He is the new covenant. And he came and he preached peace. And through him, we all have access in one Father, Jew and Gentile, every nation under heaven, from wherever you came from. Any Ancestry.com thing that you bring up, Jesus is able to be an answer for that and to bring peace for every single person in this world. Colossians talks a lot about this, so I'm going to steal from CR's class this morning. Colossians 1, verse 19, he says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him he reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, now he has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, able to stand stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So he talks about this idea of the fullness of God being found in Jesus Christ. And he comes and he doesn't make peace not by negotiation. He doesn't make peace by giving every one of us what we want and saying, okay, I'll just run around to all of us and give you all what you want. He says, I'm going to make peace by the blood of my cross. I will be that sacrifice for you. And as he becomes that sacrifice for us, he says, you were on the outside, alienated, hostile in mind, evil deeds. Now you have been brought into a new relationship, into a new family. And he wants us to present us as holy, blameless, above reproach, and he's the one that can do it. Sin is the thing that separates us from God, and he's the one who takes away sin. Sin that would separate us also from each other, right? Isn't that the problem? Usually we've done something wrong to each other. Somebody's heard something about us. We said the wrong thing. We did the wrong thing. And there it goes. A friendship is lost again. Here he says Jesus is able to change all of that if you continue in faith. What does he mean if you continue in faith? Well, it sounds like there's something expected. 
there is absolutely something expected. Please don't get the idea that just because we have this tremendous gift and just because we have this tremendous grace that nothing is expected. When you get this huge gift, what comes after that? You know what comes after that. You've gotten a gift before. When you were little, they said, say thank you, right? Isn't that what we were told? How do you say thank you to God? All right, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Let me give you another passage in Colossians chapter 2, in verse 12. For all people, he says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, having counseled the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. He said, this he set aside, nailing it to a cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Christ has made us new. He died for our sins. We are buried with him in baptism, into his death, into his blood. He's very specific about how this happens. That's not a Jewish thing. That's also not a Gentile thing. It's not something that comes from any country, anywhere. He says, this is what comes from Jesus Christ. And he says, this is the way in which you make this covenant. He's going to talk about this in a lot of places. In Acts, in Romans 6, he's going to say, we are baptized into his death. It's how we get into the body of Christ. It's how we contact this cross that has this blood that forgives our sins. And then we're raised in faith and the powerful working of God to walk in a new life. He made us alive with him. We've been forgiven of our trespasses, forgiven of our sin. He's canceled out the record, canceled out the law, canceled out the debt so that we start over again. We start over completely clean. He disarmed anything that would be against us. Any other person who would be against us. If somebody comes up to you after your baptism and say, yeah, but it's still not over. You let God deal with that. Because it's over. You started clean again. And there are no longer forces of the power of the air or Satan or demons or anything else. We are free. And we have been able to begin again. And now... We make this new covenant, and we live by faith, and we are forgiven of sin. And since we are forgiven of sin, we forgive others of their sin because of Jesus. And since we have been given grace to cover us, then we also give grace to cover other people. And since we live in peace, we also give peace to other people. Because that's what God does for us. One last passage, Colossians 2 and verse 6 and 7. There are so many of these that talk about the what you do with this. This is just a short one. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted, built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. What a great thing it is. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. We're going to live for him and follow him with our life. We're going to live like he showed us. He is the example. He's the one that we're able to follow and, and, and live like. We live like we have been saved. We live like everything else is gone. We live like there's a reason to be thankful and rejoice, not like we're weighed down by all of this debt and by all of these burdens and everything else, but we realize the more we are rooted and built up and grounded and established in Jesus Christ, the stronger we are. Because we have a reason to respond this way to other people. And when we have been, been given grace, we are able to share grace. When we have been given love, we are able to share love. We are abounding in this thanksgiving. I love the roots on this. It's amazing when you see how bold that is. 
and say, if you've got roots, you're not going to knock this tree over, are you? It's not going anywhere. And it's probably been through a lot of wind and a lot of rain and a lot of maybe snow. Not in Arizona, of course, but it's not going anywhere. When we are rooted in Christ like this, there is this overflowing of thanksgiving because of what he has done for us. And it's the way in which we're able to see this, this great joy of God being expressed in our life. And we respond to what Jesus did. You see, peace is not about winning the argument or not being frustrated. Because you might still be a little frustrated. Jesus did not make peace between our opinions. He did not make peace between our preferences. In fact, he didn't make peace by winning. He changed the rules. And he said, I will be the one that you're arguing with. I will be the one that you disagree with. I think I win. And so we do what Jesus wants. The hardest part of living is making peace with your past. Most of all, it's making peace with yourself. I see so many people who struggle with this because they can believe everything I've already said. They can believe everything that they know is there, that Jesus has grace for them, that Jesus has forgiven them, but they can't forgive themselves. They still feel guilty. They still don't know how to give peace to anybody else because I'm not sure they've got it for themselves. It's what happens inside of us and that he has made peace with us. There are always things that tell us we're wrong, always things that point to failure, always things that tell us we're unworthy. And I'm not sure that those go away, but we just have a reason now to say, yes, I am, because I have a Savior, because I have someone who cares. And the peace of Jesus deals with us first. It gives us grace so that we are able to give grace and so we live in faith for Jesus God is going to be doing things but he is we are the ones who are working in faith it's almost scary when somebody turns you loose isn't it if you come to the point in life when you've raised your kids they didn't always do the rules they didn't always clean their room. They didn't always pick up. They didn't always wash. They didn't always. And then you get to that time where you say, okay, you're on your own. It's kind of a sad feeling, isn't it? Knowing they're going to, are they going to do it now? Are they going to keep the wash, the dishes, the clothes, the room? The, are they going to be able to even handle life? Are they going to, you know, crash and burn and come home with Bags full of laundry. Yeah, sometimes there are those years in between, right? When you're still trying to say, all right, get out there. But at some point, you just have to say, do what's right. And it's up to them. It's what they're going to do. It's what they find to do because it's no longer about your choices for them. And I see that with us and God a lot. He could try to tell us about worship. He can try and tell us about where you're supposed to be. He can try and, and a lot of people want that. I get that question a lot of times. What's the least I have to do to be a Christian? I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah, how many services do I actually have to attend? Is it, you know, every week or one a month or... Well, you're kind of missing the point. He's kind of left you to say, what is worship in the dedication that you would have to God Almighty who has changed your life and freed you from all sin and freed you from any bond that would be between you and anybody else? And he's allowed you to have forgiveness not only from God, but also from other people because 
they understand what forgiveness is about and you don't hold any grudges and you don't hold any claims because after all, Jesus doesn't hold any claims. So we come down to, well, show up at church and give 10%. 10%? Okay, give what you can give and we'll let you work off the rest. How's that? Well, I'm not so sure they're happy with that either. But what happens is God has released you to do absolutely everything you want for him. And we are so overwhelmed with the freedom. We say, no, please tell me what to do. You do what God shows you next. How do we show spirituality apart from obedience to a law? How do you show faith in your actions and in what you do and in the choices that you make? We teach others about grace and we believe that God can act. We believe we're forgiven. So we forgive and we teach other people what it's like to not have anything against you. And we teach other people what it's like to be able to look at something and say, I think God wants me to do that. Isn't that how it's supposed to work? Or do we want to do it the other way? Let's just hire a staff and get it all done. And we'll come and we'll do whatever we want to. Let's, let's make it back to a law, right? You know what makes church flourish more than anything else? It's when there's genuine people of faith and you just turn them loose. My goodness, the world's never seen anything like that. Of people who go out of here looking for ways to share the grace of God with somebody else. Looking for ways to be able to help someone. Looking for ways that that they can see what God is doing in their life today, right now. And anytime you say, well, okay, there's a need here, you've got 50 people saying, me, right? You mean we don't have that? My question is, why not? If God has released you from every single thing and given you grace and given you peace and given you forgiveness, why not? What is he doing in your life right now? Don't go back to rules and saying, oh, well, I'm supposed to be in church. I'm, well, I'm glad you showed up today. What would make him happy? Because it's no longer about the what I want. It's no longer about the, well, my opinion's better than, it's all about Jesus' opinion. His is the only one that matters. And if you had this great unlimited freedom to express your faith to God, how would you show it? What would you do? How would you treat people? I want you to think about that this week. Did you make the covenant with him yet? We already talked about that. When it happens with the baptism into Christ, into his death into that blood of the cross that brings us peace so that we are able to have this grace and this faith and now able to live in whatever we see God wants us to do. Do it. What an incredible thing that is when God gives you a return like that. Absolutely show up as church. Do you think he doesn't want you to show up at church? Sure, he wants you to show up at church. Does he want you to be in Bible class? Sure, but don't come because, oh, I have to. The preacher told me I have to. And besides that, I'm still working off the other part of that 10% thing. I want you to do it because you love it. Because Jesus has given you such a great gift that you cannot help but express your thanksgiving to him.